Please join me in giving John Hall a warm Pachyderm Club welcome. Thank you for the invitation to speak to you today, and I especially want to thank Mr. John Todd. With a name like John, uh, he's all right with me. <laughs> 20 bucks, okay. <laughs> So as Mr. Todd mentioned, I'm fairly new to Wichita. I've been here about 15, 16 months now, and I am enjoying the city. Uh, I think the community has a lot to offer, and the people themselves are very friendly, generous, and want to take uh, the city to the next level. So I, I look forward to making value-added contributions so that we all can go higher. Today, I want to give you an overview of our department, Housing and Community Services Department. One of my uh, repeated phrase I'll probably say throughout this uh, presentation is, we are more than housing. As I uh, speak to various groups across the city, uh, I often get the comment, we didn't know you did all that. So I want to take today to just walk through a lot of the things that we do and then, uh, of course, allow time for questions and answers. So our department, in a nutshell, we have five distinct divisions and one uh, specific initiative that we uh, do day in and day out. And so the first one is our Wichita Sedgwick County Community Action Partnership. Um, and the next two bullets, Public Housing and Housing Tourist Voucher, those two divisions comprise of the Wichita Housing Authority. Uh, the next division or initiative is actually Housing First, where we actually focus our efforts with a joint partnership with the county in addressing chronically homeless individuals throughout our metropolitan area. And then our Community Investments Division, as well as our Home Investment Partnerships Divisions, they focus on the entitlement grants that we receive from the federal government. In particular about our Community Action Partnership, we're called the Wichita Sedgwick County Community Action Partnership. We are one of eight community action partnerships around the state of Kansas. What happens here is the federal government through the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services offers block grants that we call community service block grants that flow directly to the state of Kansas to address poverty throughout the state. And so the state of Kansas has identified eight community action partnerships to function throughout the state to really address poverty. We are one of them uh, rolled into Housing and Community Services uh, Division. So in this particular division, we do a lot of things, but before you today is a factoid of a lot of the state of Kansas. So one in five children live in poverty. Uh, actually, uh, we have uh, Kansas ranking 50th among 50 states in addressing child hunger needs in the summertime. And we have half of working mothers who lose wages when they have to take off of work to go care for a sick child. We also have one in two adults who will experience poverty by the time that they're 65. And nine of 10 homeless mothers encounter domestic violence as well as the majority of our low-income households have at least uh, one parent who is only able to work about six months in a given year. So with that lay of the land across Kansas, we function day in and day out in our Wichita Sedgwick Community Action Partnership to do quite a bit of things that will alleviate poverty throughout our community. One uh, of those initiatives that I want to underscore that we are about to launch next month is the Child Hunger. I just said a, a minute ago that we rank 50th in, this, in the United States uh, an amount of addressing child hunger in the summertime. So last year we were awarded a $40,000 grant from the National League of Cities in conjunction with the Walmart Foundation. Uh, this year of 2017, the states of Kansas, Alabama, and California are targeted to help move the needle toward reducing the amount of our kids who are uh, food insecure, meaning that they are not getting enough to eat on the day in and day out basis. So here in Wichita Sedgwick County, we have over 30,000 children who are food insecure. And so we are working in a collaboration with several organizations across the city to address this need beginning on June 4th. Um, through the summer, August, around August 4th or 6th, I can't remember the exact end date. 
So we're going to have uh, places uh, where throughout the city where we believe children can have access to free lunches uh, throughout the summer. Some of them are going to be at some of our park and recreational centers. Uh, the YMCA has a few sites and we're going to be partnering with some additional uh, faith-based institutions. Just wanted you to be aware of this particular initiative, one of the, the many things that we do. Also in this particular division of our Community Action Partnership, again, we address poverty alleviation for those individuals who earn $30,000 or less in general. That's what 125% of the federal poverty level is based on a household of four. Uh, we also offer individual development programs to help do intensive case management for our clients who need um, to break barriers to employment. Uh, sometimes it's childcare, sometimes it's transportation, sometimes it's just lacking the knowledge of basic work ethic. Uh, so we work, our staff work uh, diligently and intensively with our clients to make sure that they're ready uh, to take on a job and then we work with um, Workforce Alliance and other vendors throughout the city to actually place our clients into jobs and then we're hoping to track them for initially for six months uh, to make sure that they're able to retain a position for six months but our goal ultimately is going to be to track them for two years research shows that if a client can work for, have two years of uninterrupted employment they are most likely to be successful uh, and to break cycles of poverty uh, we also do project access this is a very popular initiative within our division where we provide access to health care uh, equipment and supplies for those who are uninsured throughout our entire community uh, and then we also do youth employment activities. Uh, the Way to Work is the, the name of the program. It has been historically emphasized only in the summertime for about eight weeks, the months of June and July. Uh, this year it will be the same scenario, but we are looking to enhance this feature. Uh, what we're finding with uh, the big corporations in town is that we need to develop the next generation's workforce so that our, our bread and butter companies here will, will always want to stay here because they will have a, a viable pipeline of, of workers, skilled workers. As we flip over to our Wichita Housing Authority, again, we're comprised of two distinct divisions, public housing and then our Housing Choice Voucher programs. So the way to remember this is public housing is housing that is owned by the city. We own it, we manage the properties, we, and we actually do the maintenance work on our properties. We have 578 units of housing that we own throughout the city. Uh, 352 of those are actually single family houses and they're scattered throughout the city. Some blocks you will be able to tell that that must be public housing because they're clustered together, uh, they look the same, but half of that 352 number is actually scattered within communities throughout the city, uh, primarily in districts one, three, and six, uh, and, and we have a, a little bit in five. We also have four multifamily developments uh, that are primarily for elderly. Um, if you're 50 and older, uh, we have a, a clientele who live in our two high rises at Greenway Manor and McLean Manor. And then Rosa Gregg and Bernice Hutchison are more of our family style, garden style apartments um, that we offer uh, one and two bedrooms. Our Housing Choice Voucher Program is a program where we provide rental assistance for clients uh, who need a subsidy, uh, but they go and find private landlords to rent from. Uh, and as long as that landlord signs up with our program and they keep their, their, their investment properties in code with the city as well as housing quality standards, they are par participants of this program and they are pretty much guaranteed 70% of the rent from their tenant because we are paying 70% of the rent and the tenant pays no more than 30% of their adjusted gross income toward their rent. Out of this uh, bucket of vouchers, the just under 3,000 that we have, we, we are given 208 vouchers exclusively for veterans who are homeless. And so this 208 number, I, I have to always emphasize wherever I speak because HUD gave us an additional 20 vouchers last year. We were at 188 and so that brought us to 208. 
we currently have 20 vouchers for quite a while that we have not been able to give out to homeless veterans, 20. Uh, the point in time count just came back a week or so ago and it showed a, a short increase of homelessness among our veterans. And we have 20 vouchers that have been sitting here waiting to be used for quite a while. It's, it's been less than a year, but it, we're coming up on a year that we've had 20 vouchers. The caveat to this program is that homeless veterans must go to the VA and work with a, a social worker, case worker, I'm not sure of what the job titles are, but then they must then be referred to us at the Wichita Housing Authority uh, and then we place them into our program. So without the referrals from the VA, these 20 vouchers will sit in my portfolio unused and HUD has me reporting to them every month, what's my progress, what's my progress? Uh, because if we can't demonstrate a need for them, HUD is eventually going to pull them out. And we do not want that to happen, especially when we have, I think, about 56 identified homeless veterans in our community. Uh, the next part of our department is an initiative called Housing First. This is the joint partnership that we have with Sedgwick County to administer the Housing First program to address homelessness, chronic homelessness throughout the city. Uh, and so the program started in 2009 and since that time period over 280 individuals have been placed into permanent housing where they receive supported services. And as of uh, the end of the year of 2016, we have 56 people who are currently housed in this particular program. The budget, we, we have about 150,000 uh, equally contributed from the city and the county that goes toward this program. And that particular total project budget allows for about 60, I think no more than 65 people to be placed at one time. So we're, we're nearing our capacity there, but we still have room to it to uh, complete uh, homelessness within the area. I keep going backwards. <laughs> All right, so we get title uh, entitlement grants from the federal government. We get three different types of uh, entitlement grants. One of them is emergency solutions grant. And this particular slide goes, oh, the next two slides go over this funding. It's a very small amount of dollars that we get. I think it's somewhere around 300,000 a year. And it is specifically to go toward addressing homeless prevention and rapid rehousing. Uh, and it provides emergency shelters. So with this funding, we work with the United Way of the Plains. Uh, we uh, listen to their needs assessment for the area. Uh, they have service providers and we actually uh, get the recommendation from the United Way on the uh, particular agencies that we will work with. Uh, to provide those homeless shelters as well as to provide our homeless prevention services which is short-term assistance for those households who are at imminent risk of becoming homeless and the Center of Hope and Salvation Army actually administer this program here locally for us and last year we serviced 15 families uh, we prevented them from becoming homeless through the the goods and services offered with our rapid rehousing this is where of individual has fallen on hard times, but they, they've either uh, landed a new job or their situation has you know changed where they now have a steady flow of income. Participating in this program allows uh, the households to actually get their footing back. Uh, so two, if we provide two months of rental assistance, we'll provide you know utility deposits, even moving expenses uh, to help that household uh, reposition themselves. And last year we helped 23 families uh, in this program. The next two entitlement grants that we get from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development are our Home Investment Partnerships um, grant as well as our Community Development Block grant. I'll talk on this slide about our Home Investment Partnerships. This particular program requires that any participation, ju participating jurisdiction who receives home funds must use their dollars to either pre, uh, create new affordable housing units or to preserve affordable housing units. So all the money that we use is, uh, in this particular program goes for those two columns. So generally we work with community housing development organizations or CHOTOs, you may have heard that term before. Uh, these CHOTOs are community development corporations primarily who have addressed a need in a particular 
a targeted area in the community uh, where a market failure has occurred, meaning there's lack of investment, private investment, and so they see a need, they want to address it, and so they see housing as the primary need in these areas, and so they work uh, as their day in and day out operations to address housing, affordable housing in these neighborhoods. And so they can use these funds, they apply to us each year, they can use funds to acquire land, to construct affordable housing, and or to do improvements to a property that needs rehabilitation. Uh, and then from that point, they also recruit uh, first time home buyers. And we offer uh, in this program as well, first time home buyer assistance to help uh, people purchase the homes that our community housing development organizations are developing. We generally produce about 17 or so houses a year, just in case you're wondering. The next uh, pot of funds that we have uh, comes from our community development block grant funds. This is the most flexible pot of dollars uh, that we can use for a variety of activities. Uh, we must uh, submit every five years to HUD a consolidated plan. And before we submit that consolidated plan to HUD, we have to have a series of public meetings, citizen engagement, where we hear from you what are the priorities of the community, how should we spend our dollars. And, and we get roughly $2.7 million a year uh, from this pot of funds. Uh, and so in this current consolidated plan, we're about to enter into the fourth year out of the five years. So we will be doing a new consolidated plan two years from now. But some of the high priority funding activities uh, that have been approved by HUD deal with infrastructure, deal with public service projects. And so this particular slide gives you some examples of how the city of Wichita uses its community development block grant dollars. We use a lot of our funding to go towards street paving, uh, water and sewer, uh, even the bike pass. We, we didn't finance the whole bike pass, but we were a major contributor uh, over a series of years uh, in uh, helping bike pass come about in our qualified census tracts areas, as well as park and rec. Uh, we help to provide parks, green space, um, to help keep those uh, maintenance and uh, rehab and actually expand. Last year, we actually added a small children's playground in one of our areas in District 1. Uh, it also goes toward a program where we help the community with emergency home repairs. Oftentimes we get calls from um, elderly who are on a fixed income, they've lived in their houses all their lives, they've raised their children there, and they want to stay in their houses. So they want to age in place, but you know the, the boiler went out or the roof needs to be replaced. So we, have the, we use our funds to help uh, residents tap into emergency repairs. Uh, the, we give them uh, deferred loans, meaning we give the money, it's not a grant, it's a loan. We put uh, a lien on the property that is only due when the house is sold. Uh, and then each year we actually forgive a portion of it. So and oftentimes uh, it, it becomes an, what I call an evaporating loan. We also use funds uh, to do fair housing activities uh, as well as uh, citizen participation. Uh, domestic violence shelters, uh, we fund uh, two uh, each year. I think we use $250,000 and, and the state of domestic violence is that there's a huge demand. Um, the service providers tell us each year that they, they have to turn away people. They're, they don't have enough resources. And so we're committed to uh, ensuring that our resources go to address domestic violence as well as our youth crime prevention. This, this is really after school activities for latchkey children. How can we put them in a safe environment while their, their parents are working uh, to provide tutorial, recreational, arts types of projects. So the YMCA, Big Brother, Big Sister uh, are some of our uh, recipients of these funds. And we talked earlier about our workforce development with our youth program, uh, The Way to Work. Okay, so I spilled a lot of things, uh, and now I'd like to open it up for any questions that you may have. Yes, sir. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, is there can a you bring the microphone over so you can hear you? I have two questions. Is there a program that uh, deals with the veterans that, that uh, 
tells them how to go about getting their, their to the VA and going through that process to uh, get to come to us. My understanding is that the VA offers, you know, a parcel of resources and services and that if they identify veterans who are in need of housing, then they work with them, prepare them, and then they eventually refer them to us. I, a couple of months ago, I've become a member of the board of the, it's called My VA Community. Uh, and so this is a consortium of service providers where we are looking to coordinate the services and, and identify those gaps. And trust me, every month I'm highlighting, I still have these 20 vouchers, I need help. Uh, and so uh, we are working to see how we can best uh, coordinate so everybody is aware of the availability to help our, our veterans in all aspects, even outside of housing. But to immediately address this need, uh, we're actually meeting at the VA. We have these monthly meetings at the VA and we have VA representation. Uh, I don't think it's, it's the VA person who actually oversees, the, gives the referrals to us. So we're starting to break down those silos within the VA to try to get to like how we can get around the table and solve this dilemma and get these 20 vouchers issued and that would reduce uh, homelessness here in the, in the area by 20. Okay, my other question is the last slide you was talking about a uh, community of uh, uh, services. Uh, would that apply to like uh, maintenance of properties for homes or for neighborhood association properties or something like that? It depends if one, if you, when you say neighborhood association property, so I assume the neighborhood association has foreclosed on a house, they own it, they want to do repairs. If, if the house is in a qualified census tract, meaning 51% of that census tract has to be low to moderate income, and for Wichita, Sedgwick County, the area median income is $66,000, so basically $60,000 or less, uh, they would be more than likely eligible to receive funds. Uh, I don't have immediate knowledge here in Wichita of having used our dollars uh, to rehabilitate a, a house with, for a neighborhood association. Not to say that that wouldn't be an eligible activity. I mean, if it meets our national objectives, one, removing urban uh, blight, uh, we, could, we could say that that meets a national objective. And if it benefits low to moderate income area, which I, I previously went over, we, we could um, find a justification there. You use the term voucher, housing voucher. How does that uh, work with Section 8, or is that Section 8? Could you explain the, the similarity or difference? You're, you're right. I, I don't like using the term Section 8 because it gives off a negative connotation, but Section 8 voucher is the same thing. Just as public housing, I mean, every time I ask this question, I say, how many have ever heard of Section 9? So that's public housing. So for some reason we say public housing, but we say Section 8 as the voucher. So I usually will just say uh, housing choice voucher. But that is the same. Gaming the system. Every program like this, obviously you're gonna have people that are trying to gain the system. The federal uh, social security disability, I mean, it's just unbelievable. What safeguards do you have in place to, to try to catch these applicants that are trying to gain the system by, by getting in, fixing their numbers to get in? Right. Well, we're required by the federal government to do annual recertifications of all of our clients. So we do the initial and then we're back out every year, one, to inspect the housing to make sure that the landlord and the tenant are complying with, with house, housing quality standards, but also we call the tenant in every year and they have to produce all this, the, the required information and documentation all over again as if they were just entering the program. Now that goes without saying, of course, where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, but once we identify that somebody is gaming us, uh, we definitely are on them. Uh, you would be surprised how many neighbors rat on their fellow neighbors. Uh, and so <laughs> since, <laughs> since I've been here, I get these emails from HUD, from the Office of Inspector General, saying we received a complaint that so-and-so has an unauthorized resident living with her, you know, uh, go check it out. And so we have to do certain things, you know, one, we call them in, but two, we, we go to the Postal Service, you know, we do a trace to see if anybody's receiving mail there that shouldn't, because only people on the lease should be receiving mail. Uh, so we, we have mechanisms built in to reduce it. I'm not going to stand here and say we eradicate it, 
But when, once we're made aware of a potential hazard, we address it immediately. My daughter, uh, my grandson, and two of my great grandchildren all live with me. Are they considered homeless? Unfortunately, not by the national standard. Um, the definition of chronically homelessness is that you have to literally have no place to go. You have to be on the street or living in your car. You cannot sleep on somebody's couch. And, and that is you know, very unfortunate because we don't want people literally out in the street. Uh, and I'll give you a, a, a very heartbreaking example. So last Saturday, I was speaking before a group and I'm plugging these 20 vouchers, you know, I guess, help me please. So a lady called me Monday and said, hey, I have a homeless veteran female, a single mother who was actually fleeing domestic violence. She has no place to go, but she's sleeping on her brother's sofa, she and her kids. Well, we connected them with the VA and by the homeless standard, they are not homeless. So they would not even help them, refer them to us to get a voucher. So the system, the reg, the regulations are so that sometimes our hands are tied. Uh, but that is very unfortunate and very frustrating for us when those scenarios happen. Okay, I was surprised to hear that the city has so many single family homes and that they're in the business of renting out. Um, and you mentioned that, so what is, I have a couple questions. What is the status of that? Are they buying more homes? Are they looking to sell some of these homes? Um, what, what is the investment in that? The other thing is, is that you talked about how many of these uh, people were serviced, chronically homeless. Mm -hmm. How many of those did we actually pull out of poverty or out of homelessness for good? I mean, just because they've been, been right. there a year doesn't mean that they so we'll stay one day right. back on the streets. Right. So let me address your, your, the latter question first. The homes, that, the numbers that we get, we get from the United Way. So you're going to have some people who um, experience recidivism. Uh, I don't know the actual numbers. Of that, like 60, 50, I think it was 59 number that we service with our Housing First initiative, those are the numbers who are currently housed. We do have successful graduates who actually come off of that particular program and they, they have a job and they don't need our assistance anymore. Uh, we just don't have the cumulative or the aggregate data from United Way on that. I would guess that it's gonna be relatively small because of the population has so many barriers and challenges. Um, you know, when you get somebody, uh, they're either their mental condition, physical condition, they're used to, you know, not following rules. Uh, and that's what happens a lot of times on our voucher program. If you don't follow the rules, we have to, even the veterans, we have to get you off, but then you can come back if you're a veteran. So we go through that recidivism quite a bit, uh, but we have to do a, a greater strategic job in helping people break those cycles. And our employment and training program that we offer, you know, trying to get to that two year of continuous employment, I think is a milestone where once we're able to help people with case management intensively for two years, I think we'll see more success stories and more data that will indicate that we are moving the needle in the right direction. And then the first question about our public housing, you know, how did the city get in this business? I would have to take you back to the 1970s. Uh, it was an initiative, I was only born in 71, so I, I wasn't there, but uh, um, it was a, an initiative, national initiative called Urban Renewal. And when I re got here to Wichita, I was like, oh my God, how in the world did we get 352 single family houses? And they're not all together, they're scattered. It is very difficult to manage. Um, and, but we received them back in the 70s as a gift from HUD. Uh, and so that is part of our public housing stock. Uh, both the single family scattered housing as well as the high rises, they all are over 40 years old at this point. So we are starting to have discussions on what can we do to renovate them or demolish them, rebuild them. Uh, and so actually those discussions are happening um, as we speak in the sense that we have submitted an application to HUD. They have a new program that started about three years ago. It's called Rental Assistance Demonstration or RAD. Uh, before then, public housing across the country 
did not have any way of refinancing, recapitalizing uh, their properties. Uh, and what happens is, uh, historically, is that Congress, U.S. Congress, has been reducing the amount of funding that they give to housing authorities to keep the properties up in shape. And so as they reduce it, housing authorities have to, you know, fix what's bleeding first, uh, leaving them with basically no money left over to do anything because the rents are based on income. They're not market. And so often, a lot of times, housing authorities were losing money. Uh, and huge deficits. So three years ago, Congress authorized this rental assistance demonstration to say, hey, we're not going to pour any more money into public housing, but we want, we really want to incentivize our housing authorities across the country to move their portfolio into multifamily housing. Now, I worked at HUD at the time. I was in multifamily housing. Uh, so that was a big plus for me, like we're going to have all these properties come over, we're going to recapitalize them, uh, they can leverage private financing at this point to actually do significant rehabilitation or renovations. Uh, options will be, you know, should we, let's take a look at our portfolio. Do we have clients now who could purchase their homes and free us out of it? Do we want to take a cluster and sell them um, and see, you know, a private sector would take over them, you know, renovate them? We would sell them. Uh, we would probably convert those particular properties to vouchers so that the private sector could do what the private sector does, and we would uh, convert them to our voucher program. They wouldn't be public housing anymore. Uh, or uh, and we, we might do a, a combination of all the three that I'm outlining. Or we could choose to do significant rehabilitation on the properties. Uh, some cities across the country have identified other sites uh, to build new and demolish the old. Uh, some have just taken the same structures and done a complete makeover. Uh, and so that's what we're going to be rolling up our sleeves to do actually this month of June. Uh, with the continuing resolution that was passed two weeks ago by the feds, uh, that enabled the RAD program to increase the number of units that they could service throughout the country. It was at 185,000 units. That was the cap. When we got our application in, they were, had a waiting list of about 200,000. And so once uh, the continuing resolution was passed, it gave HUD the authority to go up to 225,000 units, and we are in that bucket. So within the next three months, we should be getting a, a commitment from HUD to say we're going to be converted into this program. And then they're going to be asking us at the same time, what's your plan of action? So that's why we're going to be rolling up our sleeves to uh, identify our strategy. Uh, they're part of our consortium, kind of like when I mentioned the CHOTOs, Community Housing Development Organization. They, they, they're not a CHOTO, but they fit in that same category. They, they receive funding from Section 4. Just in case you're taking notes on all the sections of the act. <laughs> okay, over here. May, may I ask you to deal with a bit of a philosophical question? Uh, I think it's safe to assume that the people, number of people on assistance and so forth in budgets are growing and they're not declining, correct? And given that assumption, what would you suggest would be the way to try and get people back to work, et cetera, and off the programs. And in that regard, do you have a number on the number of percentage, for example, we take in 100 people after we do this program, 20% return right. to the real world, so to speak. And uh, if you care to comment on that, because it's a little bit of an economic situation, I understand. Right, absolutely. And to give you perspective, I've had the opportunity to grow up in plain view, so. Right. Yes. <laughs> Certainly. I hope I remember all uh, three components of your question, so I, I may need you to repeat some. But the demand, I, I believe, was the first question. So, you know, it, it's kind of a, a carrot um, stick or the chicken before the egg, whichever analogy you want to use. Um, because the federal government is not increasing our budgets, they're actually decreasing them. So we're not able to service the true demand that's out there for the, the subsidy or the rental assistance. So we have what we call waiting list, uh, and then we just work through those waiting lists. So we're in, in essence, we're not increasing the number of participants. And in some scenarios, we're kind of recycling them. We have um, attrition rate of about 40% of our uh, clients who receive any kind of assistance from us 
fall off each year. And so as they fall off, people on our waiting list, we're able to put them on. Uh, but each year, people don't follow the rules and they, and, and they get removed. Or we, we do have success stories where people are in our family self-sufficiency program, which is a five-year program where they commit to say, hey, I want to become empowered. I want to have a job, upward mobility, so I can come off the program. Uh, we have about 15 people a year that come off of our roles through that program. Uh, and so, again, it, it's a cycle where as people come off, we have people waiting to come back on. Uh, and so right now, we, um, I mentioned the numbers earlier, we have about 2,700 receiving vouchers, 578 for public housing. Uh, and so the biggest turnover in that portfolio is our voucher. The, the people in public housing, uh, as far as our 50 and older, they're kind of pretty much set in our program, for lack of a better term. Uh, they have a lot of com um, challenges, such as disabilities, uh, things of that nature uh, as, as a whole. The scattered site families, we are working with them to try to empower them to, to get into that upward mobility portion like our family self-sufficiency program allows. But that's a voluntary program. We can't force people to participate, uh, but we encourage it. We, uh, I currently do uh, outreach to my tenants every six weeks. Uh, we call it Love Where You Live campaign where we provide uh, resources that, that are available, but also we wanna know how are they doing in our housing? Are they taking care of our houses so we can reduce our cost uh, and become identified with you know, maintenance things that we need to, to be aware of. So it, it's, it's opened up that dialogue to help facilitate. We have activities such as, uh, I didn't highlight yet, but our housing expo uh, where people from all economic backgrounds will come together and have um, access to resources, how to buy a house, how to land the next job or participate in our job training. Uh, if, if we do have clients who participate in our employment and training program, that individual development program, uh, that are on our assistance and we work jointly to help them break the cycles of poverty that way. All in all, we probably have a, a, somewhere around 20 to 30 individuals who come off of our roles uh, on a yearly basis uh, by using those uh, programs jointly. Do you see a correlation between the economics periods when we're in a downturn versus if we're able to create production and jobs as is currently being attempted by the president? Is that helpful in your area when we have a good economy? I would think my hypothesis would say yes, uh, but I think the key here is aligning what the business demand are for the jobs with our training. So the, the, blueprint, the blueprint for regional economic growth or BREG, we are now starting to cater our job uh, readiness training geared toward those industries so that we know there's already a demand for those job, those types of uh, advanced manufacturing or logistics, whatever they may be, so that we're preparing our clientele to, to be ready for jobs that they can actually get and not jobs that are not gonna be there. So I think uh, it, it, all, it always depends on a good economy, but it also depends on having a developed workforce who's ready to take on those particular jobs. And you have to work in tandem uh, in preparing the community, those who are looking for, one, a job, two, upward mobility, uh, so that they're ready to take on those jobs. Thank you. I appreciate the presentation, information on uh, people, but you kind of give me the impression that you've got an awful lot of property that you are responsible for here in Wichita. Can you talk about the dollar amount of that property, whether it's you know, from a tax appraisal point of view or from a uh, from a depreciated valuation on the city's annual financial report. I mean, how, how much? When you say I think it was three hundred, was it three hundred fifty-two units you got you got from the feds? I mean, what's the what's the tax value on that, those properties? So the actual unit is 578. So we have 352 single family houses and then the other 240 something are our high rise units where we have about 90 units in each and then we have two other garden style apartments. I, I do not know the value. That is something I'll have to either send to Mr. Todd to brief you the next time or you can always invite me back. Uh, but 
the month of June, because we're getting ready to convert our, our portfolio into this RAD program, we will be crunching all those numbers. So I will know them uh, like the back of my hand uh, within the next 30 days. Thank you, Mr. Holler. You're doing a great job. Thank Your you. Your presentation was great. Thank you. Uh, my question is, um, not only would I like those dollar amount that uh, Mr. Peter John was talking about also, mine is going to be dealing with uh, the crime and uh, who is over looking these properties. And my concern is the public housing and the vouchers. And it appears that, um, let's see, 2,770 vouchers, that's with the private and the public, Partnership, Private. Private. 70% the city's paying for it. That's our taxpayers' dollars. And the other 30% the people are. Right. Uh, my concern is once the private um, partnership get these people into the house, and I watch, I'm one of those type of people that look and I'm watching. <laughs> um, move in, here you got the mother with maybe two small children. And pretty soon, there's thousands of people living within the house. And the next thing you see, um, they're sitting on the porch, probably uh, smoking their weed and drugs. And then uh, several houses going back, cars going back and forth. We know the deal on that. So my deal on the voucher system here that our taxpayers' dollars is paying for. Also, when they fix these houses up, I went inside to see exactly how they are fixed up better than my house, the granite top line and everything else. That's our taxpayers' dollars. Who is watching these people when they move into, and I'm going to call it what it is, Section 8 houses, because that is our, our money and the crime that is going on within the midnight hour within that. The other, I'm looking, you have it right there. Youth crime prevention and enrichment. Who are you working with on that, the youth crime and the prevention? Because I have already talked to Chief Ramsey, mm -hmm. and there is an increase in crime, as we know here in Wichita, and the gains are coming back. And most of them are going into the public housing and the vouchers. So, who are you working with, oh, maybe Chair Easter or the police department? Can you answer that for the crime? Okay. So um, on youth enrichment, crime prevention and enrichment services, so we work with the YMCA, Big Brother, Big Sister, DECA, I think are the three currently funded organizations, um, and they have funding that goes through June of this year. Our program year starts July 1st. So our recommendations from the city council um, went in March. Uh, we have to go back. Uh, we would have already gone, but with the continuing resolution, we won't go back until July to, to get the final approval. Uh, and you'll see uh, a couple of different more organizations at that time. Uh, but in general, uh, the whole thing of you know who's watching, who's in, who's the enforcement, what's the enforcement mechanism? We talked a little bit about that earlier about compliance of people gaming the system, but any time a citizen has concerns and you know you're observing um, suspicious or peculiar behavior, you have options. One, you can contact us at Housing and Community Services. We have an email box. You can send a note or you can call us, leave a voice message. Uh, we will notate it if some people call us and don't want their name or phone number So we have no way of following up with them But we what we do with that is what I mentioned earlier. We, we run the traces through the uh, Postal Service You can also go to HUD OIG.gov They have a mailbox or a toll-free number you can call and say hey, you know I live next door this type of activity is going on what HUD OIG will do is they will send it to the Kansas City Regional Office, who will then contact us, check it out. We need a response by so many days, and so we have to be responsive uh, to those types of inquiries. In general, about, okay, what do we do about just the criminal element? I know that, one, any time that there is gunfire or criminal activity happening, sometimes it's 
it's on our public housing property. Sometimes it's near it. Sometimes it's just affiliated uh, because that's public housing and it has nothing to do with public housing. So one, we had to filter it, but two, I work very closely with Chief Ramsey and his team. Uh, anytime that it does involve public housing, we are finding a way legally how we can evict. Uh, if, if they're guilty because, you know, their kid is in a gang or whatever, we have all kinds of scenarios that happen. Uh, and we work closely with our law department to see what mechanism do we have, uh, either not to renew their lease or to see if this is a violation that would get them out. So, but again, fair housing laws are, are alive and well, and we have, to, we have to walk that balancing act. But those are, that gives you a sense of, of what we do. Um, for that, and then we have the council members who are also aware, and they contact us for follow up. Uh, I know that Council Member Williams does her impact meetings, where she actually, wherever an incident happens, she's walking the street, getting people to encourage. So when we find out information that way, like if it is ours, we are do we are building our administrative case, uh, and then action will eventually occur. But oftentimes, it's not immediate unless we actually have um, one of our residents. And actually, I'll, well, I want to give you an example, but we, had, we have had examples where in the news it's our resident. Uh, and so we had to be very careful on that too because just because a, a public housing participant is arrested does not mean that that will be a conviction. So that is also uh, fair housing. So we, we walk that rope very tightly, but fine. Uh, and, and we do manage up and raise a level of expectation of our tenants. Okay, over here with Shirley. Okay, you've talked about uh, helping the people to know to get a job and to be a good employee and so on. Are there any required financial management classes? I know that Habitat requires that that person go through financial management. Mm -hmm. So right, yeah. Part of our individual and development program IDP, uh, we go through various life skills and soft skill training that job readiness. So the financial literacy component, um, you know, in previous cities I've been in, we use the Money Smart curriculum by the FDIC. There are ten different topics modules, uh, and so we teach that here as well. Uh, and it's it's one of those things where one time is not going to make it stick. Uh, you actually have to reinforce it and, and you know, say, hey, this is your assignment between your, our next meeting. Develop your spending plan. I want to see what you spent and what you brought in. Make sure you have that structurally balanced budget. Uh, and then it's redirecting, you know, think about savings. Don't spend everything you earn. So it, it's that constant reinforcement. And that's why it is imperative uh, that we work with clients for it, uh, we need to get to that two-year benchmark where we believe they will then be, they'll have it, they'll have the tools to be successful and not come back. I would suggest that we refer to a Dave Ramsey course because it gives them step by step by step by step exactly how to be successful. Great. We're always open for best practices. Hey, I'm going over here to John Todd and then I'll leave the microphone with him. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Hall, thanks for being here. Uh, you, uh, you, you've had quite a variety of experience, particularly uh, your experience in Washington, D.C. Uh, have, have you uh, observed cities that approach this and, and with private sector solutions? And can you give us some examples of that and how well that's worked? Uh, certainly. So I have done uh, this business of housing in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, I was the housing director. Not only did I work for HUD in Washington, D.C., but I left HUD for a time to be the housing director for the District of Columbia uh, and as well as in New York City. So, and in the larger markets, especially, you know, Washington, D.C., where it, it was the hottest real estate market in the country, uh, there was definitely a public-private, you know, uh, portion of collaboration. At the time, you know, we had the American Reinvestment Act. Uh, we had Neighborhood Stabilization Program funds where we actually did comprehensive, what I call consolidated request for proposals to see what developers out there could meet our business need. And that is one, uh, not only providing affordable housing, but permanent supportive housing as we talk about homelessness uh, and, and uh, the, the need for supportive services. So we did various um, projects so on, on permanent supportive housing, we, we started off with an initiative to do 100 units of housing to help those um, who needed 
to provide a project with operating uh, dollars, capital, as well as supportive services. We worked with various agencies, Department of Mental Health, uh, the Housing Authority there. We worked with the Department of Health and Human Services. So really bundling all of the resources that we have and to see where the private sector could build to meet this need. Uh, and so that was very successful in Washington, D.C., where you have so many developers uh, you know, competing and wanting to, to build from market rate all the way to affordable housing. So, so that, when those funds were available, we had huge partners, public-private partnerships. Now that the dollars have dwindled, uh, it's about, okay, how can we best do this? So I'll give you an example of kind of what uh, a precursor, what I'm contemplating here in Wichita. So with this rental assistance demonstration program that we have applied and, and should be in the program in the next 90 days, it's going to have a public-private component. So we have these 578 units of public housing. Uh, once we decide what we're going to do with them, if we're going to demolish them and rebuild them, I mean, these will be public-private partnerships. We're, we're not a builder. Um, and so we will be leveraging resources. We'll be going to uh, banks to get uh, financing to help leverage the dollars that we get from the federal government. We'll, we'll seek uh, either 4% or 9% tax credits, whatever ways we can to put the project together to, to make and build neighborhood assets. So, so there will be potential for public-private partnerships. We will we'll, we'll do requests for qualifications once we're ready, announcing it to the public, uh, and whoever is interested who can meet our business need, we will review them and, and we will forge that partnership. John, uh, tell me, uh, how do folks who are in need of your help get in touch with you or your organization? Definitely, uh, we're located at 332 North Riverview and I brought cards today. Uh, Walk-ins are always welcome. Uh, our phone number is 462-3700. Uh, if you go to the website, the city's webpage, wichita.gov, you, you'll see the listing of all the various departments. You click on Housing and Community Services Department. We have done a much better job in keeping our web pages updated with fresh information. So you're gonna see all of our programs. You're gonna see this, this presentation on, that's on our web page too, uh, because I want the public to know what we do, who we are. Uh, and if you identify you know, where we can be of assistance in there, or even if you have questions like, we may not provide the service, but I bet nine times out of 10, we know who, d who does and we can get you to them. So definitely contact us by email, phone, or walk-in is the best way. John Hall, let's give him a big hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.